Welcome, everybody, to this Emeritus College General Meeting with a special presentation from the Poetic Odysseys group. First, I acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sailwith-Tooth peoples. Uh, UBC is a community of learning. The Emeritus College certainly is a big part of that, and we have much to learn from our Indigenous stewards of the land and teachers. Today, I'd like to acknowledge one special member of the Emeritus College. Um, many of you know Joanne Archibald. She's well known for her contributions to advancing Aboriginal education and learners. And she's done a lot for the college as well in terms of providing resources for us to help educate ourselves about indigeneity and indigenization. You may not know, you may not, that she's just begun as Chancellor of the University of the Fraser Valley. And I know you'll join me in, in congratulating her. And uh, wishing her well in, in those endeavors. The uh, announcements are, are few today, but important. I, I really acknowledge all the authors who brought their uh, really diverse publications here for us to see. It's a, an amazing indication of the way the college helps to highlight um, diverse intellectual uh, fields of study and bring them together so that we can share and learn. And, uh, oh, there is a slide later. There's another book display to bring your attention to. Oh, that one in, in the photo. The, the bookstore has um, responded to a just a kind of an inquiry about whether we could have some uh, displays to set up books by setting up a display of some emeritus authors' books in the, in the bookstore. You could take a look at that too and tell the bookstore staff how much you would appreciate that support. Uh, the newsletter, the next uh, edition will be out later in the spring and there's a call for submissions, uh, May 1st deadline. Um, inf more information is, is provided in the email notices that we get regularly. Uh, next meeting, the annual general meeting, is when the new council and exec will be elected. If you would like or know somebody who would like to be nominated for council, um, please do submit a nomination, May 3rd deadline, to the, the office. UBC Giving Day was the 4th of April. It was a new initiative for UBC to be part of that university-wide uh, one-day boost for giving. We got into the queue rather late, but the development office really put a big effort behind us to get us in that and uh, on the web uh, as, as part of that process. And the response from Emeriti and other people, I don't know who they are, uh, was amazing. We raised... Uh, well, it was well over $22,000 in one day. It was a great response to help uh, continue the many programs uh, that the college offers. Um, we will be developing a more uh, solid fundraising uh, strategy and campaign in the coming months. It will be an important part of the college going, going forward. Um, you may know that the college uh, collaborates with other retiree organizations. Um, the Canadian one, the CIRAC meeting will be in later May. Uh, we'll have representation there. The uh, European organization, we have Diane Newell attending on our behalf. And the Canadian US organization, Arohe, um, We'll have an online kind of symposium uh, seminar in the fall. Uh, Arohe is the one that provided or organized that three-part seminar series that we've all heard about in terms of preparing for retirement. Uh, special interest group updates. Uh, the newest one that we've been told about, uh, Paul Steinbach uh, sent around a, a notice about that, the sports group organized by Harry Hubble uh, emeritus from education. Um, if you are interested, it's 
involving a range of sports tailored for older folks. Uh, uh, but it's using UBC facilities, but also there's something happening at, at facilities on the North Shore. Um, if you're at all interested, uh, look on the website and, and link to that and see what the range is. There may be something that's, that's of interest to you. And really exciting too, uh, we are making a connection finally with retirees at the Okanagan campus. Um, a few of them, recent uh, emeriti, have come forward and put out their hands saying, we'd like to really be part of the college. How can we do that and what can you do to help? Um, so we are, we've organized a meeting for the president to speak to retirees there in early June. Um, I'll be along too to talk about the college. Um, we want to really start that up as a, as a solid group that feels part of the college, not only for retirees from the Okanagan campus, but for retirees maybe from here who've moved up there to have a, a way of connecting with the college. But they have already started a kind of umbrella special interest group focused on outdoor uh, adventures activities uh, based on the interest of, of some of their members. So those are the recent developments and upcoming opportunities for you. For another slide? Right. Now to the reason that we're actually here, besides seeing the, the books. Members of the Poetic Odysseys group um, will be presenting their work today. Uh, the names of, of them here. Uh, it's really appropriate that this is happening in National Poetry Month. Uh, I think that may be uh, serendipitous, but we'll take credit for it. I apologize that I have to leave half partway through the presentation. I have to take my wife to uh, a medical appointment. So if you see me slipping out while you're speaking, please don't be offended. It's in no way a comment on what, what I'm hearing. Um, I um, have the privilege of being on the email group that this, this group operates, and I see the po poems that they share, and I'm really looking forward to hearing them in person present their work. And Judy Hall has graciously offered to uh, manage the question and answer session at the end and, and close off the session. So I'm not going to be emceeing. George McWhorter is. Um, you may know uh, Dr. McWhorter, Professor Emeritus of Theater, Film, and Creative Writing. Um, he was Vancouver's first poet laureate. Uh, he's an acclaimed uh, poet and translator, and his self Portrait in the Zone of Silence, which was on display, which was translated from Spanish and written by the Mexican poet Homero Arites. Uh, it's just been announced as on the short list for the uh, Griffin Poetry Prize. That's the premier national prize. Uh, so we're all rooting for, for George. So welcome, George. I turn it over to you. And thank you very much, all of you, for having us, the Poetry Odyssey Group. And before I start, I'd like to say that Judy Hall here, uh, she was the person who originally twisted Philip Resnick's arm to get him to start a, an emeritus poetry group. And... Uh, Philip twisted our arms and the group came uh, together. I should say that Philip also is our intrepid leader in Zoom sessions and live sessions, and he is our organizer supreme. Okay, so uh, to let you know about the poetry Odyssean poets, uh, and their poetry, best uh, I just introduce them and let them read some of their poems to you. Okay, our first poetry audition is Sandra Renault. Sandra grew up in Saskatchewan 
After a career in teaching, she was a grad student administrator and instructor in UBC's Faculty of Education on this campus and in Kamloops. Her academic field is philosophy of education. She has written poems on education and schooling, on writing, uh, on little used words, animals, birds, even insects. Sandra. Thank you, George. And hello, everyone. My first poem is Vulpine. I was taken aback when you asked me to dance. Crowded hunting floor, my hair cut badly, sister's shabby dress pinned to fit. The one who brung me a possessive noun, hounding for another. Music pressed in on us, neither waltz, nor twist, nor jitterbug, for which my galloping legs would have been wooden. You stepped shrewdly. I hustled hopefully. But in the dimness, your beard bothered. Your incisors protruded. Your ears twitched. Your eyes shone flirtatiously, all a little feral even for a country girl. You led. I followed. We were a pair dancing in step. How easy it would have been to stay. Around the last thicket, you held me closer and heard my anguished yelp. I'd mistaken you for another, a foxtrot like no other. Sanguilinacy, an addiction to blood. Here we go again, fault-finding, red-stained hands, panting breaths, Swords sheathed for brief moments amid the din of competing claims, like vessels freed, projectiles in the night sky. Red transforms the meek in us. Even tempers flash moment on moment till plotting resumes. We want to see death somewhere, elsewhere. We scream, no mercy! to liars, cheats, warmongers, conspiracy sophists. Hang them high, drain their blood, while our hearts bleed into pale imitations of life. Campanula, which is the scientific name for bellflower, if I sang out as clearly as you, I wouldn't hang my head, but stand steadfastly in full sun. Raise my head when growers turn their backs, shed my blooms on velvet carpets. I'd share my lavenders, purples, blues, with new whites, pinks, and rose. Your kingdom is your choir's robed strophe. And I can only wonder, explore the cultivar. If I sang out as clearly as you, I wouldn't leave you, nor dig you under and over, oblivious to your carol and call, to tranquil art and glamour. Peacock. You think we cannot catch you, Preen, when all we see of you is sheen. You stand and wait beyond the screen. I watch you in your day's routine and marvel at your plumes, jade green. You pick at grubs, bugs, peas, and beans. There's five and ten and then fifteen. They keep your health a fine routine. Your body's fit a libertine who's out beguiling hens serene. And when she sees your plumes between slight turns her way your golden mean, 
She'll move toward do things on scene, since you will fan to intervene. We'd never criticize Demain, for we too once were young, 18. You'll carry through, please your queen, from ages long, white empyrene. Your poise since time's Paleocene, exaltations above the Byzantine. Even saints revered like Augustine herald your charms, sans rude screen. And what of us, plain folks and clean, devoid of pride, dull grays have been. Where'er your colors plucked between our primping nods to shades marine, are bent to flash and dash for swing, when all we bring is one blue jean. Thank you, Sandra. Now, our next Odyssean in verse is Jeffrey Blair. Uh, Jeff is a retired UBC uh, pediatric surgeon. He still enjoys hiking, canoe trips into the back country, and obtaining inspiration from nature. He found poetry years ago to be an emotional and creative catharsis amidst the drama of his career. He is well aware of what cathartics most often produce. <laughs> Ta -da. Thank you, George. I sit with a spruce tree while my son paints the scene of a lake beneath a mountain below a cloud-strewn sky. The sun burns the glaciers, and I hear ancient water sprinkle down to the lake beneath the mountain, below the sky, just beyond where I sit with a spruce tree while my son paints the scene. We walk in large lands. We speak of dreams, his clear voice lost to me in the wind. I'm full of questions, not answers, it seems. But should I be asking or just hike in the sun across that rock-scattered ground, stopping to listen while my son paints a scene? I sit, finally seeing while my son paints a scene of a lake and a mountain below clouds in the sky, the waters of ages siphoned down to a stream, now running beside us beneath the mountain beside the lake, where we sit with our souls, now in silence, awake in our dream. Medicine Lake. Yellow smoke from distant burning forests dims this morning sun, hazes the view of this saddened lake, one loon circles its heavy, still waters, rippling the reflection of the burnt sticks which line the shore. An osprey, wary of me, beats a tireless flight amongst the blackened pines, and I see her nest atop a charcoal tree, her young on its edge, look out at the only world they know. Yet throughout the cremated woods and amidst the gray rocks, the hopeful fireweed flourishes. Some of you may have seen this at the airport. The canoe on the ceiling. I was waiting at the airport when I looked up and saw the canoe hanging from the ceiling. A cedar strip it was, beautiful and smooth. Its hull had a glistening glaze that begged to be touched, but it was out of my reach. The wires holding it in place beside the fluorescent lights had been strung in such a way to tilt the boat so passers beneath could see its ribs that had been carefully spoke-shaven. 
The yellow wood steamed, bent, and coaxed to hold a tension against the planking. The center thwart, wide at its middle, was a curved crescent, fitting for a portager's neck. And subtly carved shoulder rests would ease the carried burden. The two seats in bow and stern, each with sinewed webbing, looked somewhat comical. Suspended upside down, they were taut with no sags, no weight had ever been upon them. The canoe in this odd place, in its peculiar suspension, looked as though it was capsizing. It felt foolish. It wanted down. I wanted it down. No one glanced up as I gazed at its beauty. People and luggage hurried beneath its capsizing hull. Their jet planes had disgorged them and were ready to take others away. This canoe, suspended from the ceiling, was an anachronism. It had no place in our world now except as decor. A mostly ignored relic of a slower time. If only I could take it down from its gallant loft, I would get it to some lake or calm river, and we would paddle away. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> I bet you're still wondering about the cathartics. Okay, our next uh, Odyssean is Jess H. Brewer. Jess is an emeritus of UBC's Department of Physics and Astronomy. About himself, uh, Jess says, the first poetry I loved other than nursery rhymes uh, was uh, Robert Service's The Cremation of Sam McGee, which caused me to fixate on rhyme and meter, thus rendering me forever out of touch with modern poetry. So I say whatever I want, however I please, about whatever pops into my head without fear of ever being taken too seriously. Okay, Jess, all your questions. I tend to write really short poems, so uh, this, will, this will be like a, an abstract or a series of abstracts. The first poem is called Relay, and it was written in 1963. Uh, these are supposed to be recent poems, but this one is still pretty current for me. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to have it written on my cremation urn. <laughs> it does summarize. <sighs> then, when the uniform was new and muscles flowering in the flesh, when exultation thrusted you into and through the bursting dash. There was the handle. Your easy hand took it in stride, a green baton, rushed it through the cinderland, and finishing, eagerly passed it on. And the second one wasn't much later. <laughs> Uh, this was in 1967, and it's about, it's nominally about Florida, which is where I was born and raised, but it's called The Swamp. I enter quick, rabbit scared of the dry sticks, crackling reeds and weeds, once watered sedge. Dry fear dangerous eats at the swamp's crisp edge. With the muddening of the earth, my scampering softens to a slink. Lungs reach tenderly to touch the humus stink. Shrink, but stay. I give a dead stump's less birth. Gracefully crawling now by scummy pools. I hide in spidery grasses. Feel small fishes nibbling like persistent wishes. Softy at first, the swamp asserts its rules. Insects, intermittent fog falls, intersperse the silence, 
alligator calls now echo low. Coiled and beaded eyed, I need not rehearse the slither or the strike, for now I know the serpent's still in perfect marriage. More that even this fearless moxin form of man pays obeisance to the land. All's as before. And finally, something reasonably recent. This is from 2021. It's called either afterlife or afterlife, depending on which way you want to say it. Um, it's sort of, it is sort of my personal experimental theology. <laughs> you always thought you would die and then be resurrected to live again. Or you lost someone you loved so much, you invented heaven to stay in touch. Or you simply refused to believe your soul could just disappear down some black hole. Or maybe you chose to believe that spark would go with your body into the dark. Or that all of your joyous exhilaration was only part of a simulation. All wrong. All right. All misconceived. It matters not what you believed. It matters not which part you played in the personal universe you made, from which to learn, with which to touch the other gods you miss so much. Thank you, Jess. No, <clears throat> it's my turn. Like Jess, uh, I write poems about anything that uh, crosses my mind uh, or catches my attention. In this case, uh, an old film of uh, mezzo-soprano Conchita Supervia singing to a small soiree and this very feral young man in the audience watching her. Conchita Supervia sings. She sees him in a time of pelts, when animals had to disguise themselves as men, and men as animals, the better to deceive their prey. And thus their faces grew alike, this jaguar-jawed young man with feral brows and nose his gaze as reposed as a philosopher's. He metronomes the beat of the blood in Conchita Supervia's throat, the swelling vein of disarray in her mezzo aria, an escalating sacrifice claws at her behind the lethal daze of his attention and his face with the eyes to his mind, unmasked in wait for the tendered meat of her hand's caress. Around his starched collar and ears hangs a cape of mink-fine hair, but black as jaguar ink, it leaves a stain on her body and mind for how impeccably level his eyes are. He has all the time in his life to wait for her last note, the diva with the voice of an inedible bird his paw craves as its plaything. The next uh, incident uh, that drew my attention took place uh, on the way to a hill town in Andalusia, Spain. At the side of the road, through the high meadowland, a hunter picks up his hound by the hind legs like the rabbit it chased earlier and dumps the dog 
in the trunk of the car. A woman who has stopped her old Seat with her husband still sitting inside gets out. Don't be cruel. Don't do that. That must hurt, she says to the man stowing away his dog with the soft tan coat and soft pink muzzle. It bred for sport, not, not hurt. Neither the hunting dog nor the man. Look at her. And are the bulls bred not to feel the hurt? She asks, but he has stopped listening. High in the white town ahead, the school band has played a Sunday suite in the junction between four streets that serves as a square. Titbits of brass that create a tinny, a tinny echo as they blow, then fall over the cliff that walls off the town. La Bodega del Bosque, the Inn of the Woods lunch menu, is local venison and rabbit stew, which tastes stringy with fine bones all through it, like pieces of a feral uh, Meccano set, from which the woman who watches her husband eat it reconstructs her case for vegetarians. Okay. Now, I believe our next uh, reader is on video, Sarah, and it is Michael Charles Healy. Mike uh, took his BSc and MSc in zoology at here at UBC, and his PhD in natural history at Aberdeen. He was with Canada's Department of Fisheries for 20 years, then 20 in UBC's Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences before retiring in uh, 2007. Northern Lake Fishes and Pacific Salmon have been the focus of his research. He tells friends, I grew up in places where it was easy to develop empathy with trees and tide pool sculpins. Mike writes poetry with an environmental flavor, all flora and fauna, but also love and loss loom large in his lines. The first poem he will recite today, I Heard the Owl Call My Name, he wrote some 40 years ago. Good day, Professors Emeriti. My name is Michael Healy, and I'm a member of the Emeritus Poetry Group that will be entertaining you today with some of their poems. I regret that I am unable to attend in person, but Sarah has arranged that I can recite three of my poems to you remotely. I appreciate the opportunity to do that, and time is short, so here goes. The first poem is a riff off a wonderful book by Margaret Craven entitled, I Heard the Owl Call My Name. I expect that many of you know this book, and it is a story about self-discovery and loss. My poem is also about self-discovery and loss, but in a very different way than Margaret Craven's book. I heard the owl call my name across a darkening meadow on a soft summer evening. I'm sure I heard it call to me, a sad, beseeching cry. In my brittle life, there was no room for owls. I did not wait to hear it call again, but hurried on my way. The glass through which I viewed the world is shattered now. I see more clearly how the pieces fit. I call to the owl as it called to me, but the owl is gone. My next poem is about something we all crave, even as we get older. And that something, of course, is love. 
If one's life has been filled with love, I expect there are still times when one doubts that love is real, doubts one's capacity to attract love, and I think it's especially true as one grows older. I call this poem Wanting. You are the jingle in my pocket, my pieces of eight, though the tinkle tells me that you are not pure gold. I would mold from you a locket, earrings coiled into a love knot, just to keep you hanging round, to feel you brush against my throat, the skin beneath my ears, softly, softly, telling me lies. My obsession is a flowing tide whose searching fingers full and wide curl around my soul and draw me under. I cannot breathe, I gasp, I blunder, I writhe, my heart must burst, I reach, I am released and cast upon a sandy beach, wet, glistening, brittle as pyrites, while the ebbing tide moans softly, softly, telling me lies. I lie on grains of sand, the frozen tears of other lovers, other loves worn smooth. Is it too late for me? Am I just dross? The bitter fragments of a broken dream. I long for you to quench my fear, to toss me in your living fire, to mold from me a gold lavrette, that I may ever feel your lips caress my body and my soul, softly, softly telling me lies. The silver glass decries my body and my life. My sides bulge out, my shoulders sag, my clothes don't fit. My face is made of fractured stone, hard as iron, cold as slag. I was a maid once, soft and sleek, with lovers gathered at my feet, all gone. And yet within the circle of your arms, I see that maid alive again, shining in your eyes, softly, softly, telling me lies. My last poem is about the slow loss of faculties that we all experience as we grow older. Right now, my brother is drifting slowly into dementia. He is unable to remember what we spoke about 10 minutes ago. He's still happy and lively, but I know this is the beginning of a long, painful slide. I call this poem Inside Memory. Pieces from my fractured past, fragments that I try to fit into one coherent memory. There's a mist, a veil that drifts in and out. Sometime it parts for a moment and lets me see clearly where I am and what this is. A cottage on the Siwa shore, my home, a place I love, I can't recall. It feels familiar, but is it real? The sea is real, the ineffable sea. I want to wade deeper and deeper until its lights of green and blue engulf me, wash my memory clean and carry me away. So that's it for me. Thank you all very much. See you next time. If it's possible, I'd like to send them a long distance. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Our next reader is Philip, Philip Resnick. And Philip is a professor emeritus of political science. Uh, he is also a published poet with several books, some of whose uh, poems have been Greek inspired others political, and still others covering a wide variety of themes. He is also, as I said before, our intrepid leader, the leader of the poetry Odysseans. Okay, uh, well, it's my pleasure to read five short poems, but uh, all written in the last, uh, roughly in the last six months, but on very different themes. My late wife was Greek, so there is a very direct connection with that country and with the region from which she came, which is Thessaly. It's up in the northeastern part of the country. And that is actually, the picture is a view of the Aegean, literally the olive grove behind the house. So it's pretty clear where that is. I was back there in, uh, sorry, my, my Ben, my coming through. <clears throat> I was back in Greece in September, and uh, there was an atmospheric river which came through and lasted for four days, a really intense amount of, of uh rainfall and uh which sort of did a fair amount of damage i must say to the region uh to the infrastructure to orchards and to animals and so on some loss of life human life not that much considering anyway it led to a cycle of poems and the one i will read <clears throat> was written just after the rain had finally stopped 
and it's called The Legendary Sea. <clears throat> you will miss these early morning hours, sun filtering through the foliage, the rippling waters of the cove beneath you as you scribble these lines. <clears throat> Journey where you may to points north, south, east, or to your west coast home, the vista will never be the same. So despite the storm which pummeled Thessaly, the debris still scattered by the shore, the heartache so many have endured, you will recall the scene when you are gone, this legendary sea that will always hold you in its grip. Uh, the next one is a political poem. Uh, I write a fair number of those, surprise, surprise. This one was inspired by the uh, wonderful war which broke out in uh, Gaza, uh, Israel, Palestine back in October. I'd better just explain three of the words in there which may not be known to, other, to everyone. Shoah was probably best known means is the Hebrew word for uh, Holocaust. Nakba is the Arabic word for catastrophe. And the Latin phrase vi victus is a woe to the defeated, just to put it in context. In the tit for tat between Shoah and Nakba, between the victimhood preceding that fateful day in 1948 <clears throat> and the victimhood that followed, how is one to choose? Hegel may have claimed that world history is the world court but historians bring their own biases to the bench and scarce, rarely I should say, are their judgments beyond question. Perhaps the Latin has it right, vi victus, though in the long run, even the winners may lose out, even if those alive today will never know. The choice, it seems, is not really between right and wrong, but between the pain and suffering of each side and between who will have the courage to reach out. Now, the next one was written in early February, and it's called If This Be a Valentine. And the title is there because it is a curious kind of valentine because it's not addressed to someone living, but to someone who has passed away. That's why the title. So... I'm not afraid to die, he said with a shrug, though he knew it was a lie to lull himself to sleep on a cold February night, dreaming of hands touching across the deep ravine, separating the living from the dead, of the sea of words in which poets through the ages drown, of a spear that pierced a fallen soldier on a Grecian vase, and mortars in the killing fields where Muscovy encounters Kiev, of kisses blown in the fevered heat of youth, oblivious as was each generation's want to trysts gone stale and vestiges of love strewn helter-skelter in the sands. The next one is, I suppose, is a commentary on our own state of mind. I suspect most of us, all of us, would have come of age in the immediate post-war years. And in retrospect, we have to say we had a pretty good run of it. We compared to, I think, what is coming, we're well aware that ours was a very fortunate generation. So this is a short reflection on that theme, on a sea of contingency. It crept up surreptitiously the realization that things we'd once believed with certainty had proven as fragile as figurines made of clay. That the post-war years of affluence, of carefree indulgence, were but an interlude between one era of conflict and the next. That what lay ahead, we could feel it in our bones, was not the harmony of imagined communities coming to their own, but the unfolding of scenarios gone rogue. Now, 
And the final one, to end on a slightly more upbeat mode, since I do tend to be a bit gloomy, but I think the times are gloomy. This one is not. So it's called The View from Spanish Banks, which we all know. And in my, in my department, although it's beginning to fall off the numbers, uh, a number of us, uh, the Emeriti, have been walking that beach now for close to a decade. Uh, on a, usually once a week, and this was inspired by one of the walks along Spanish banks. Strollers can count the vessels lined up in the bay, awaiting a berth in the nearby port. Many heavily laden with containers, stuffed with all that Asia sends our way. Vancouver is this country's gateway to our Pacific interface. And through the highs and lows of plagues and wars, the ships keep coming, for commerce cannot sleep a single day. Sometimes one wants to shut one's eyes and wish it all away, too much consumption to sustain. Sometimes one is amazed at how rapidly this Cinderella of a lumber town has come of age. Thank you, Philip. And now we come to the last of our poetry auditions, but not the least, uh, Helen Spencer. Helen uh, has an MA uh, from the University of Auckland, so she comes from abroad and was a department head of the College Preparatory English at Vancouver Community College. She is the partner of a member of the Emeritus College. Helen sees things that move her to write poetry, flowers, family, and special places are all triggers and Donald Trump. Aotearoa. I almost took root again in this land of my birth. The tumbled, joyful valleys, the shouting stars, the hectic rain, and the quick shadows across the land as the fat, washed clouds cantered above us. How it rained. Paddocks shone, lush green, spangled with dandelions. Lambs lay almost hidden in long grass. Horses in blue raincoats. And a river of cows streaming down the hillside to be milked. I stared at the bull calves, shifting nervously staring back at me with black-ringed eyes. The wide river called to me, flooding and flowing, flax flowers bowing in homage, cabbage trees stiffly saluting. Where the hot stream ran into the lake, the swans swam languidly. Only a thin layer between me and the chemistry, vivid below. Sulfates pushed through the fractured rock, Cruel colours, acid yellow, bile green, in steaming pools with crusty, warning edges. Tui and fantail, wax eye and billbird, aerial acrobats, embellished the bush with a filigree of song. I feasted my eyes on the festive scarlet of blossoms that mantled the Bahutakawa trees, then gazed and gazed at the long white lines of endlessly breaking waves on the western shore. Going for a swim at Kitt's Pool. I walked down the hill under the cherry trees, a perch for angry crows, past the patients parked beside their minders. How long before I join them? Do they remember how it felt to swim? Everyone is looking the same way, across the sparkling pool to the sea, to the etch-a-sketch city against the morning sky, and the mountains, slightly ashamed of their parcels of forested properties spread out like a moth-eaten blanket. 
I clutch my bag of swimming things and refuse to be distracted from thoughts of the pleasure to come. I walk into the pool as the light plays in rippled rings of aqua and indigo, turquoise and silver, endlessly marrying sunlight and water. I plunge into this gift, this glory. I grow a second skin as the water slides over my hot shoulders, a net of silver bubbles merging, dissolving. Each arm shapes an arc, each hand pushes down on cushions of water. My legs scissor me steadily forward. When I turn my head to breathe, I look through amber lenses. I see stills from a movie, a, a woman hitching up her swimsuit, a child's face, eyes shut, streaming wet and laughing. I slip through the water, a seagull flaring away overhead. Back in the world, I climb the hill again, tired and happy. The patients have been wheeled away. The crows are silent. Behind me, across the bay, the mountains quietly nudge the sky. And now for something different. Trump's golden shoes. When Trump went to sneak con to flog his sneakers, he was booed by some people and began to look weaker. The high tops were painted a fake looking gold and he autographed a pair that amazingly sold for $9,000. The buyer, unbidden, said that he'd bought them for his children. What a ghastly gift, a foolish mistake, a reminder of grift and his stories so fake and his lies. How he lies with no shame, so his name will remain in the news, on the lips of his fans, in the press. What a mess. I implore my friends in the land of the South, just dump the bomb. I want to thank our readers for reading and the college for hosting the reading and you all for being a kind and attentive audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Okay, that way. Oh, we can stay at the table. Okay. Well, in my case, uh, I'll be. I was. I grew up in Montreal, and in the high school I was at, I happened to have a teacher who was uh, at the time a well-known Canadian poet, Irving Layton, whom some of you may remember, uh, who also was a mentor to another poet who occasionally showed up in the school. We kind of all knew he was an up-and-rising poet, but we didn't quite know how much. Leonard Cohen, not that I had direct dealings with Leonard Cohen, but Irving Leighton did, did serve, to, in my case, certainly to inspire an interest in poetry. And I even scribbled and got a little book out, and I would not, the single one of those poems is worth reprinting, that's for sure. But in my, I think it was 16 or 17. But the other key thing in my life was literally the encounter with Greece. It was through that, through my mar marriage, which was 70, 71. Uh, that I started to go to the, re the Greece, and of course the first poem mentioned it, but the region my wife was from is not unknown in Greek mythology. The city she was from, which is called Volos, had another name in antiquity, it was called Yolkos, and it was the site from which Jason and the Argo sailed in search of the Golden Fleece, so there was a bit of mythology there. And Mount Pelion, which is right next to it, where that picture was taken of the uh, of the little place in the cove which we have, was the site where Achilles was raised by Chiron. This was the mountain of the centaurs. And it was also the mountain where the gods came down from Olympus and the muses uh, to celebrate the marriage of Peleus and Thetis. So poetry was in the air, and it certainly began to play a big role. And from that point on, I think I got started. Anybody else? Just sing on. <laughs> Way back. Oh. Actually, when I was in uh, high school, I decided I was going to be a poet. That was my my life's path. Uh, and then I needed to get into college, and so I thought uh, I'm going to have a lot have a lot better luck if I if I list my best subject, which was physics. And so I I went to university. Uh, claiming to be a physicist, but of course in complete den denial that that soulless uh, pass passage into uh, the evils of science would, would ever overcome my, my uh, passion for poetry. But as I studied physics, uh, I, st I found that there was a very s distinct similarity between physics and poetry. That is, each one was, was had as, a, as its goal to distill down the vast, you know, infinite slurry of information to its essences. And pretty soon I decided that yeah, it was six one, half a dozen the other. But I never really got back into writing poetry because I lack the arrogance to think that people should listen to what I say. <laughs> it is so interesting. I love it. Who else? And get your questions ready, you all. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, was, I was tempted just to say that, but um, I, I uh, didn't have aspirations to be a poet like you, Jess, or anything. Um, and uh, I, I suppose this is a, an apt group to say this to. Uh, in my field of medicine, you, you actually, as in so many things, tend to occupy most of your your electrical neural activity to one side of your brain. And it was actually toward retirement that I realized that there was another half of my brain that I perhaps should wake up. Um, originally, my poems were depressing and elegiac, uh, poems about death. It actually got to the point of being a bit depressing, actually, to read my own poems. They were always about death and despair and you know and the end is coming the end is nigh but um and then going hiking and canoeing with friends and my my sons uh it got me out in nature and there's so much to to actually write about and be poetic about and it's all about the muse of course and i don't know so what she i don't know what going she does with your son i just loved it inspiring there, anybody else like to talk about how, because I think any one of you could, you know, do a little bit, join the group. No questions for these wonderful poets? Yep. Yep. Yes. 
Oh. Where? Okay, one, and then we have another. Thank you very much for what you have given us. Uh, I'm still sort of reeling from some of the images that were evoked, <laughs> especially the golden shoes. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask, do you people meet, you're the uh, group of poetic odysseys, do you meet periodically in exchange and uh, your work? Or are you all individuals working on your own? Thank you. Well, we meet uh, at the moment on, on Zoom uh, each month. Uh, on a Tuesday at two o'clock. <laughs> if that answers the question. And ahead of time, uh, we distribute uh, two or three poems. Often uh, we'll read the three or two or sometimes just one, depending on their length and the discussion in between, sort of where it goes. And the discussions can go all over the place, not just about poetry, but about the places in the poetry or about the issues in the poetry, and off it will go, basically around the world and back again. I think there's another question there. Thank you very much. Uh, tremendously inspiring from somebody from the Faculty of Medicine and doing academic writing, and which takes multiple drafts. I'm just wondering, it is all so polished. And I mean, has this taken hours and hours and hours of refinement, or does it just sort of come out in this perfect form because your, your sentiments and uh, you know, your emotions have kind of all gelled together? I'd just love to hear your reflections on that. Oh, I could see that. <laughs> I think I could have written that one. <laughs> but I would love to hear your um, your thoughts. Sure. Well, um, I certainly did a lot of the academic type writing, so I don't need to be told what that is. And I think actually, from my own point of view, one of the great graces of the poetry, since I tend to write shorter poems, I mean, if I was trying to compete with Virgil or Homer, that would be a whole other story, which is beyond beyond the reach. Uh, the, the advantage of poems is they're usually, um, sometimes it's a first line which some, somehow comes, and once I have that first line, the rest writes itself, quite frankly. Sometimes it's something I have read, it may be a quote which sets a poem off. Uh, political poems, there's so much happening in the world, if I were to chase that, I wouldn't stop, but fortunately, you know, there's only certain things that do inspire. But it's, it, there are those moments, I think the others would, would share this, where when it's really surprised, I sometimes write this poem and I'm very surprised where it came from because it does seem to come from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but having said that, it's not, uh, it's not the case that it always comes out picture perfect. I will admit I will go through six or seven drafts sometimes. A word doesn't fit, the, or I'll think it over, but it's, no, no, it's, you know, whatever. So it's not, it does, you know, occasionally it is a case, that it, it may be the case that something comes out pretty well finished, but I, I would think most often one reworks it and reworks it, and sometimes multiple drafts, but I should let others... Um, that, that poem that I read of a sit with a spruce tree, um, my son, who's actually in the Department of Geography here, he, uh, he goes out with me and we hike for days and camp in the Rockies. And it's it, the process that I write poetry is very similar to the process by which he paints. He does in the field plein air sketches and I do plein air poetry. I've got to occupy my time somehow. Um, as he's painting the scene and so I sit and just write and then I take it back and sometimes I shove it in a drawer and literally it can be years later and I'll pull out and say I'll, I'll revise this and um, I'll probably revise those poems I don't have any uh, I, I don't feel like any poem is ever finished I'm sorry the first one was his painting yes it's Lake O'Hara perhaps you're familiar with that yeah, and that's what, it's very inspirational uh, environment.
anybody in poet can begin from can you where they presently are. And you probably would want to draw on your own discipline like uh, Jess has and Jeff. And for me, I was in education, so I wrote, unknown to anyone else, a whole series of poems about education and schooling. I haven't done anything with those yet, but it got me started. And I'm sure we have some budding poets in the audience here who could take a piece of paper down to Kit's Pool, Helen's Kit's Pool, and sit and muse on paper and begin that way. As a child, I loved rhythmic poems. I loved memorizing poems, but I never considered myself a writer at all and only got going in the early 2000s. But it was wonderful to join this poetry group because we have the input and authority and wisdom of George, Bill New, Phil Resnick, Graham Good, and everyone else who have helped us. And most of us are newbies, but they provide an anchor for us and guidance and corrections when we need it. And that's, I think, essential. Anyway, you're welcome to join us if you're so inclined. Well, we have some new members, Dan Pratt in education and Ruth Dirksen, with whom I have not been associated before. And so we're a constantly changing group as well, growing. Thank you. I, I just wanted to mention, you, somebody asked, how, how, does it, how does it come out? And, and, and I think the answer is, Everybody here has had the experience of writing a, a paper uh, in which you first, you start by writing an outline, yeah. right? And then you start filling out uh, the each, each heading on the outline. And then pretty soon you realize the outline is completely wrong. And so you have to redo the outline. And a lot of poems are like that. Uh, all, the, all the okay ones are like that. <laughs> but the really good ones just come out. And you may... Change a change a word here and there, but I find that one of the most one of the most creative pro parts of the process is looking for rhymes. <laughs> they give me ideas. I, mean, I say, oh, "What can I make rhyme with that?" And and I so I look up the, all the words that rhyme with that, and I say, "Oh, that could be. Oh, yeah, that fits right in." My poems always start with very strong feelings, so I have a great many elegies for friends and family who have died, understandably. And a lot of poems are to my family who are still alive, including my granddaughter. I wrote her a poem on her first birthday. She is now 18. So I've been writing poems for a while. Flowers turn me on. I can spend a couple of hours standing in the garden looking at an iris flower before I can write the poem. But I really, really look carefully and try hard. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Bill New. Uh, I wasn't. Uh, I was in the group for quite a while, and then for various reasons, I had to withdraw because my time had to be used in other ways. Um, but I'm reminded uh, of uh, an old story that a Canadian is someone who goes to meetings and says nothing, and then afterwards complains about not having been listened to. Uh, and I thought I'd. As I've said nothing so far, I'd better say something. Uh, I've written um, a dozen books of poetry. Uh, there's another one coming out this year, which is uh, ambiguously called um, Inventing What We Need to Know. Uh, and it uh, is really about the way in which uh, I think our lives are shaped by the stories that we've been told, the fairy tales, the family tales, all kinds of stories, most of which are not true, uh, but our lives are shaped by them, and they also shape the, the way in which we tell stories ourselves, or the way in which we write, things we write about, how we write about them, what we understand, what we think we understand, and the difference between those two things. Um, I... Uh, 
the book that's on display here, which is called um, the, the, um, In the Plague Year, was written as a kind of diary uh, between March uh, 2020 and March 2021 uh, about my experience and my family experience of, of COVID, not of the disease itself, but of the, the year in which we all lived through COVID. And so it's, I didn't write every day. You know, back to the question of when do you write? Um, I am totally unable to, uh, as, as, uh, as I've heard before, some people get up and, and write for an hour before um, the, the, the world begins. Uh, I can't do that. Uh, sometimes I will write, sometimes I won't write. But in the case of the year of living through COVID, I only wrote when there was a new word that came into the news, when when I discovered that people were inventing ways to talk about uh, a, a six foot difference, which is the distance we had to keep uh, from each other for that entire year. Uh, one of the poems that I wrote was about the way people learned to walk, uh, one in the middle of the road and one on the sidewalk. Uh, because they had to keep their six foot difference. Uh, another was about um, the, and the, the, the different words we had for it. Some people said, you have to keep a sari length between each other because that was a, a way of understanding how far uh, we, we had to stand. Uh, so there were new words came into the vocabulary and each time there was a new word, there was a new experience, and that new experience led to a, a, another uh, another poem. Uh, sometimes it was statistics, which I um, didn't like hearing because it was a st statistic about how many people had died. Uh, sometimes it was um, something that was cast aside, like a uh, a used mask on the uh, on the sidewalk. Uh, so what did that mean? What did that mean about the the, the person who'd abandoned the mask? Uh, so I wanted to I wanted to find a way of understanding the world that was around me, and in a poem, as in much of the other work that I write, it's been a, a process of trying to discover what it is that I understand. So it can begin in generalization after generalization, most of which have to be abandoned in order to work your way back to the specificity of, of what it is that you think for a moment, at least, you actually say you know. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Oh. Any questions? Well, what, what I wanted to, uh, Bill Rowe, my discipline is social work and, and uh, a colleague of mine uh, about uh, three decades ago started up uh, a journal called the Journal of uh, Poetry Therapy. It's been very successful. He's a colleague at Florida State University. And uh, I connected with him a number of times because my work was in addictions and poetry was uh, a cathartic way for, for many of my clients to be able to express themselves when they could not do it through discourse or discussion or any of that, but poetry worked for them very well. So I wanted to thank you for what you shared with us today and uh, recommend that particular journal if you want to take a look at it. And I'm sure all these would be <laughs> welcome to that particular journal. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, I really enjoyed the poems. Thank you, all of you. They were great. And I just have a question about the writing process. Sandra, you were talking about you know doing cursive writing. Um, and I was just curious because we are of that era where word processing came in a long time ago. And I was wondering if you found any difference between writing poetry through the cursive method versus sitting and just producing writing at the keyboard. I, for me, for me, I found keyboard when I learned to keyboard, I could suddenly write. And before then, I was always censoring my words as I sat down to do cursive writing. But I'm just curious for those that are writing poetry, if you've had similar experiences in which you prefer. I always start my poems with a piece of paper and a pencil. And um, I may 
do two or three drafts like that, and then I'll print it out and have a look at it printed, and then I'll write on that, and I go through a lot of paper. A good fountain pen. I'm sorry, I have to disagree with my colleagues here. <laughs> Go ahead. I've been, uh, I've been sitting beside a guy who has a book on display about AI, so I couldn't help, I couldn't resist uh, 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 getting your, uh, the opinion of people in this uh, group about the emergence of AI. So as an experiment, I just put in to the chat GTP, GPT, I said, write a poem about the golden shoes. And the first, uh, the first uh, verse says, In fields of shimmering gold they tread, Those shoes that sparkle never dread, Each step a dance, a tale untold, With threads of dreams they're bound in gold. And there are three more verses. We, we better publish that in the newsletter. <laughs> Do you think I should send that on to Mr. Trump? <laughs> anyway, I wanted to say how much I enjoyed uh, this session in poetry. What a nice idea. So I think we better publish that in the newsletter. That was just too good. So what a wonderful session, you all. And I think for the whole group, for us to realize that one of our special interest groups can produce a program. I mean, we have such interesting special groups. I, I, I am very biased, but I think we have the best emeritus group in the world. And that's because people take initiative. In other words, you've got something interesting. Is there anybody else? Well, there will be somebody else from somewhere within our Redis group who want to join you. And it's very easy to start your own special interest group. Somebody just has to be responsible for organizing and reporting to the office so it gets on the calendar. But it is just wonderful. And again, thank you so much for putting it all together for us. And we don't quite know how to do this, but usually the speaker gets, oh, we have one for everybody. So we have an, a, a coveted umbrella for each of the people who produce. Thank you so much. It was really fantastic. And if you look at the upcoming events, I think the one thing we want to point out is the Philosopher Cafe, which I think you know is the group that meets at Tapestry. The date has changed. But the Philosopher's Cafe is really fun for any of you who haven't been. The people at Tapestry, because we have a relationship with them, um, come down and talk about a topic. And this topic, I think, is, uh, is the United Nations still relevant? So it's really worth um, attending. It's really fun. It's fun to go to Tapestry and their wonderful discussions. Um, so I, again, want to encourage you to start your own special interest group if you want. Um, and, um, and, and thank you so much for the staff who put all this together and remind you that there are, I can't remember how many books over there, but you should go take a look as you uh, pass away um, to... to <laughs> That uh, pass out. Um, <laughs> that doesn't work either. Anyhow, go buy the books because they're totally wonderful. Yeah. Oh, and don't forget to take your book home. Absolutely. <laughs> but do do take a look because they're just such wonderful books. And we'll see you all next meeting. <laughs>